All right, Mark chapter 4, beginning at verse 35 through 41. The word of the Lord reads today, And the same day, when the even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he, Jesus, was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly, and said one to another, What manner of man is this? that even the wind and the sea obey him. <laughs> talk about missing the point. <laughs> I want to talk to us today on the topic, Unnecessary Acts of God. Unnecessary Acts of God. If you bow your heads with me a moment, Master, once again, Lord, I'm looking up from the bottom of a deep pit. Like Joseph, I feel like my brothers have abandoned me, left me to die at the bottom of a hole. And Lord, as the old saying goes up, to see the bottom, I've got to look up. Master, I need the anointing. I, I have never preached a message in my life but that I have not sought the anointing of the Holy Ghost. The anointing compensates for our own emotions. It, it compensates for our own disappointment. It compensates, Lord, for feelings that are overwhelming us and troubling us. I don't need right now, God, to allow my thoughts and my feelings to be disturbed and to disrupt the word that you've given me for God's people at this time. And I don't want them to. I want to be able to deliver a word from the Lord to the people of God. I want that word to encourage, to inspire, to uplift. And most of all, Lord, I want that word to bring a greater level of faith into our lives than we've ever before had. Anoint today your speaker. Anoint, Master, the ear of every hearer. Those today, Lord, who are watching live, those who will watch later, by reason of the Internet, let the power of God rest upon me, let it rest upon my words, let it rest upon each and every hearer. Lord, that I might speak a timely word, a word that is fit and proper for the moment, and that the people of God might receive it with gladness. Master, in the name of Jesus, we ask these things. Amen. Praise God and amen. We know the story of Jesus calming the sea. We've heard it, we've read it, we have heard it preached upon 
on any number of occasions and oh how we celebrate the deity of Christ as it is manifested in this mighty, wonderful, glorious miracle. Our God manifested himself in human form. And in that form, he reserved the power and the authority to speak to his creation and to bring calm and peace to a tumult and a storm that might have otherwise destroyed this series of boats that were crossing the sea. While many of the miracles performed by the Lord were meant, they were meant to serve as manifestations and as displays of the divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen carefully now. The calming of the raging sea was not such a miracle. Did you hear what I said? Many miracles were meant to reveal the divinity of Christ, but this miracle was not meant to do that. In fact, listen to me, this miracle, at least in the eyes of the Lord Jesus Christ, was totally unnecessary. Oh my goodness. We often find ourselves panicked and crying out to God for divine intervention in situations which the Lord would prefer we could just trust Him through. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. Did you hear what I just said? <laughs> How many times do we run to the Lord panic-stricken, screaming and hollering, Lord, do you even care that I'm in this situation? Now the preacher's preaching to the preacher. That happens sometimes. I'm going to be honest with you. I'd be lying like a fool if I didn't tell you the last week I told the Lord more than once in not such pretty terms. You know, Lord, do you even give a care about the situation that I'm in? Do you even care about what we're going through down here? Do you, does this even matter to you? I'll tell you, the enemy comes against my mind, people. The enemy often tells me, you shouldn't even be preaching this message to these people. These are godless people. They're not interested. They don't want to know anything about God. The LGBT community, oh, they want to stand there and bitch that people say they're godless and people say they don't care about the things of God. Yes, I know I used the word I just used. They want to crab and complain, Tommy, that people look at them a certain way and have all these preconceived notions and all these preconceived ideas about them. But what do they want to do to change those notions and change those ideas. Not a thing. Because that takes effort and they don't want to put forth the effort. I told you, I said, doing what I do is hard. It's not just a matter of it being difficult to get up and not have anybody to support you in the preaching of the Word. That's not even... That's not even where the biggest part of the difficulty comes from. The biggest part of the difficulty comes from the fact that when you work your backside off for year after year, decade after decade, and consistently, consistently get handed 
a pie like was made on the help. And you consistently look across your seats and see no progress, see nothing happening. The enemy comes in. And the enemy starts speaking to me and start telling me, you're preaching the wrong message. You're not. You're preaching a false message because if you were preaching the true message, surely God would bless you with people. You're not even preaching a true message. You're not doing what you ought to be doing. That's why you don't have any response. That's why nobody's coming because the whole nature of your ministry is wrong. You try to get up here every Sunday and do what I do when you've been having to hear the enemy scream that in your ear all week long. See if you don't run to the Lord. Hollering, Lord, don't you even care? Don't you even care? Do you not care about anything that's going on around here? Crossing that sea only took a few hours. I've been going through my storm for 30 years. Pretty near. How many times, though, do situations come in our lives and trouble us and disturb us and rattle our cage, as it were, and immediately we run to God? I'm not talking about... Folks, I'm not talking about you've been going through a trial that's lasted 30 years. I'm talking about when something is going on and immediately we're running to God and we're saying, Lord, you don't care about me, Jesus. You don't care about me, Lord, because this storm has come and you're expecting me to have to sit out this storm. In the last five years, I've had storm after storm after storm come visiting my boat. First, I had to sit in the doctor's office and have a doctor tell me, well, you're diabetic, and not only are you diabetic, you're bad diabetic. Not only are you a bad diabetic, but you probably have been diabetic for many, many years. I struggled with an issue related to uh, hypoglycemia for many, many years. It still happens to me to this day. When my sugar drops below a certain level, my body is so accustomed to a very, very high level of sugar that my doctor explained it to me this way. She said, your body is so accustomed to sugar levels way up here that when your sugar gets down to here, mind you, down here is still way above the level it should be, okay? But when my sugar level gets down to here, for those of you who understand the numbers, I'll give you the numbers. When my sugar gets down below 200, now normal is supposed to be under 100. My sugar gets below 200, and immediately my whole personality changes. My whole demeanor changes. Everything about me changes. I will use language that I never use normally, that I despise, that I hate. I'm being honest, people. I could stand up here and act like I'm perfect and I walk on water. And, you know, I don't play that game. I am I try to be honest. I try to be, uh, you know, honest and clear with people. Transparent. My whole personality changes. I become angry I, I am extremely irritated and irritable and I start talking and saying things I would never say 
They let me eat, and guess what happens? About 10, 15, 20 minutes later, I'm normal again. I'm fine. For almost a decade, I went to my doctor. And I told my doctor for almost a decade, I said, I've got this problem, and I described it to him. And I told him, I said, my grandmother is diabetic. My great-grandfather was diabetic. He lost both of his legs because of diabetes. I said, I know the warning signs. I know the symptoms of diabetes. I said, I'm wondering if maybe this issue I'm struggling with doesn't have something to do with diabetes. And for almost a decade, the doctor that I had told me, you're fine, you're not diabetic, you're fine. Never tested for it, never did a thing in the world to, to figure out if that was a problem for me. Nothing. Couldn't even get them to do that. Finally, I got a new doctor. The service that I used in Dallas, uh, he transferred out and a new doctor came in. Her first visit with me and I told her exactly what I had told him for almost a decade. And she said, well, let's do this test. She said, it will not tell us if you're diabetic. She said, but it will give us an indicator of uh, whether or not we need to look into your being possibly diabetic. So she did a certain blood test. Don't ask me what it was. I don't know. Test results came back in. She said to me, Charles, if you're not diabetic, I'm not black. She was black. <laughs> she said, if you're not diabetic, I'm not black. She said, this test result came back and it's bad. She said, we have got to do a glucose tolerance test on you. They gave me the glucose tolerance test. I drank the sweet liquid that they want you to drink. And within seconds, I nearly passed out literally. And they had to sit me down in the chair because I went and drank the stuff standing up, had no idea how it was going to hit me. And it hit me like a, like a lightning bolt. And I almost passed out and hit the floor. And they, they helped me into a chair. They found out my sugar was at 600 and something. My doctor told me, she said, it's a miracle that you're not blind. It is a miracle. I went to the eye doctor because they wanted to check my eyes because diabetes can affect your eyes. And the eye doctors told me, he said, it is an utter miracle. He said, your eyes show absolutely no sign whatsoever of damage. And being as serious a diabetic as you are, he said, that is Nothing short of miraculous. Okay, Pastor, why are you telling us all this? I'm trying to help you understand today. You don't have to get panicked every time a storm shows its face. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you, God can get you through the storm. It is not necessary that the Lord calm the raging sea for you to reach the other side safely. Oh, hallelujah. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? It is not necessary for God to calm the raging sea for you to still get to the other side of the storm safe. I was in a storm I didn't even know I was in. I knew I had the, the 
issue with my personality changing and you know and that was a storm and i didn't like it and i used to ask the lord lord please help me god please help me lord please i told tommy for years he and i were together for many years while i was going through this and i kept telling him i said this isn't me i don't understand what is going on? I said, this has to be biological because this isn't my personality. This isn't who I am. It troubled me. It did enormous damage to my self-esteem, let me tell you. It battered my self-image something awful. There were so many times that I was ready to quit the ministry and give up the church because, honestly, because I felt like such a blazing hypocrite. But I knew, I knew, I kept telling Tommy, I, said, I know that this is not who I am. I don't act like this normally. This is not how I talk. This is not my personality. This is not the kind of attitude that I have. I said, I don't know why I keep struggling with this and struggling with this. But even though God didn't calm the storm, he didn't make the diabetes go away. Are you listening to me? He got me to the other side. I finally got it diagnosed. I finally began treatment for it. And guess what? Things that could have happened to me all those years that I was on the stormy sea didn't happen to me. Hallelujah. He kept me when I didn't even know I needed to be kept. Hallelujah. He protected me from things I didn't even know were attacking me. I'm here to tell you God oftentimes wants us to learn to trust Him while the storm is raging, when the skies are the darkest and the thunder is the loudest and the lightning is the brightest. He wants us to trust Him. How many times people quit living for God, quit trying to serve the Lord because He doesn't do things the way I want it to be done. Lord, every time the thunder starts to crack, every time the lightning begins to appear, I expect you to calm the storm and to quiet the seas. I expect life in Christ to be nothing but calm and peaceful waters. Well, that would be nice, except for the fact that the Word of God tells us that our God causes His Son to shine upon the just and the unjust. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? What does that mean? That means in a nutshell, good and bad things happen to good and bad people. People have written books. Why do bad things happen to good people? Well, honey, there is one passage in the scripture that answers that question. You don't need to write a whole book on it. Because that is the nature of life. That is the nature of the world in which we live. Just because we're a child of God, God doesn't suddenly change all the rules for us. Oh my goodness. All of a sudden, the weather's always good where we live. All of a sudden, it never rains. All of a sudden, it never storms. All of a sudden, we never experience sickness or disease. All of a sudden, everything is perfect. Because, honey, if it worked like that, every person on the planet 
would be a Christian, you'd have to be an idiot not to be. If everything changed like that, am I telling the truth, for the believer. But what does change is, we have Jesus in our vessel. Hallelujah. We've got the God of all the ages riding in our boat. Oh my Lord have mercy. And honey, as long as he's in your boat, you're going to be okay. Whatever you're going through, whatever you're experiencing, whatever trouble that you're facing, whatever storm you're having to weather at the moment, at the moment, at the moment, at the moment, there has never been a storm in the history of the world that has continued without ceasing. Am I telling the truth? So whatever storm, whatever trial, whatever tribulation, whatever struggle you're going through at the moment, and you want to cry out and say, God, don't you even care about me? Why in the world aren't you changing my circumstance? Just remember, after Jesus calmed the storm, he turned to his disciples and said, I'm paraphrasing. Why are y'all as upset and troubled as the sea was that I just calmed? Why did you let your circumstance make you more like it? Oh my God, have mercy. I hope you're hearing me today. Why did you let your circumstance turn you into it why did you let an external storm become an internal tumult oh my goodness he said how is it that you had no faith and you see in our story you see how it reads and in verse 40 and 41, they turn around and they look at each other and they say, Oh my, what manner of man is this that even the sea and the wind obey him? They're missing the whole point. Don't we do that? Do you see why God doesn't always calm every storm that we're in? Because if he calmed every storm that we're in, we would never, ever, ever learn that he's still God even when the storms are raging. Glory to God. He's still God even in the midnight hour. Paul and Silas were in prison. They were in chains. They were in stocks. They were in the deepest dungeon. They were under the guard of a Roman centurion. It was dark. It was dismal. It was dank. And it was time to worship God. Hallelujah. Because he's still God even in the midst of the storm. And they knew it. You know why I come to church every Sunday and I still preach and I still sing and I still worship God even though they nothing, nothing, nothing here looks like I'd like it to look. Nothing here that helps me to feel better. Nothing here that encourages me. Nothing here that supports me and holds me up. But do you know why I do it? I'll tell you why I do it. Because he's still worthy to be praised and I know it. And just because there's a bunch of people in Huntsville, Alabama too stupid to recognize that he's worthy of praise, I'm not one of them. Ask Tommy how much time I spent singing the songs of Zion. 
He spends 8 to 10, 12 hours a day away from the house. I haven't got a church full of people. It's not like I have hospitals to visit or people to see or anything to do. So I spend the majority of that time by myself at home, alone. You know what I do? I talk to the Lord. You know what I do? I worship God. You know what I do? I sing the songs of Zion. You know why? Because he's worthy to be praised. My circumstance hasn't changed God in the least. Hallelujah. The Lord was asleep at the back of the boat. You know why? Because he knew there wasn't nothing to worry about. <laughs> but instead of taking their cue from Jesus, they took their cue from their circumstance. Oh my goodness. I hope I'm preaching to somebody today. Mm -hmm. If I had some Holy Ghost filled people in this building, well, we might just be shouting and dancing and running the aisles about now. Because somebody would be getting this down in their spirit and it would be speaking to them and communicating something to them that they had never thought of before. We are so often looking for God to change our circumstance rather than learning the lesson that He is still God in the storm. Rather than begging the Lord to calm the storm, Jesus would have preferred the disciples were able to trust Him and stay calm in the storm. There's an old song which is based upon this biblical anecdote which is titled Can You Still the Troubled Waters? One more time. My great aunt and uncle Dorothy and Travis used to sing this old song. Can you still the troubled waters? One more time. <laughs> While the sentiment is sincere and certainly brings inspiration and encouragement in difficult times, it entirely misses the whole point of this biblical story. The point was not to illustrate the Lord's ability to calm the raging seas. That was an incidental, factual revelation. No, the true intent of this story being shared was to illustrate the Lord's disappointment, listen to me, with his followers who could not remain calm and faithful in the face of a stormy passage. Were they not making this journey at the beckoning of the Lord? Wasn't it Jesus who said to them, Hey guys, let's cross over and go to the other side. Yes, it was. That's how that whole journey began. Why in the world when God speaks to us and we experience trouble afterwards as part of the process of getting where we're going, why is it that we become so fearful and we allow our circumstance to change us? Why do we do that? Didn't the Lord tell us, hey, let's go to the other side. Got news for you. God ain't going to tell you, let's go to the other side so he can drown me in the middle of the sea. By the way, he's on the boat with you, so if you drown, he's going to drown with you, okay? No, 
Why do we do that? I remember when I was 16 years old and God spoke to me as a teenager just a couple of months after my 16th birthday. And he told me he wanted me to go to Fort Worth, Texas. He wanted me to be in a place where he could train me for my ministry. He could teach me about faith by uh, through my living it, not just reading about it. He said, I'm going to teach you. I'm going to train you for your ministry. But if you're going to preach faith, then you need to know how to live by faith. I was only 16 years old, for heaven's sakes. You know what I did when God told me to pack up and move to Texas? I packed up and moved to Texas. I was 16 years old and I was smart enough to know that if God tells you to do something, only a fool refuses to do it. Ask Noah. Excuse me, Jonah. Don't ask Noah. Ask Jonah. Amen. No, I knew even at 16, I knew. I said, hey, if this is what the Lord's telling me to do, then I guarantee you as sure as I'm alive that I'm going to be better for doing it if I tell the truth. I was terrified at that time in my life. Not afraid. I was terrified at that point in my life of flying. I had never flown in an airplane. I had no desire to fly in an airplane. But I also had no desire to sit on a Greyhound for 28 hours. So I decided I was going to fly. You know why? I decided I was going to fly. I decided I was going to fly because if God spoke to me to go to Texas, there was no way in the world that plane was going to fall out of the sky. I got on that plane that day and I literally, literally, I, I, <laughs> I was cocky. I was cocky with faith and I wanted to look at that plane full of people and say, folks, we're going to get where we're going without any trouble. We're going to arrive safely because God has called me to Texas. And if the Lord told me to do this, then there ain't no way in the world this plane is going to fall from the sky. You see, do you understand the lesson there? Do you understand the mindset there? Why did the disciples not have this mindset? The Lord said, Let's go to the other side. If he said we're going to the other side, whatever we go through between here and there, we're still going to get there in one piece. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. <sighs> Tommy, <I'm laughs> I hope you're putting some pieces of the puzzle together because it's, it's coming together in my spirit even as I'm speaking this. Definitely. Why in the world would the Lord ask them to pass over to the other side only to have the ships go down in the midst of the sea, killing them all, including the Lord himself? In Acts chapter 27, verses 20 through 25, and when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. This is Paul and Silas and others being taken prisoner on a ship. And they experienced a storm that began to tear that ship to pieces. But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, ye should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed 
from Crete and to have gained this harm and loss. See, Paul tried to warn them. You, we don't know. There, there's trouble. There's going to be trouble on this trip. We need to stay where we're at. But they wouldn't listen to him. So they packed up the ship and they set sail anyway. Now Paul is saying in essence, I told you so. <laughs> he said, now everything's being broken up. Now you're losing all your cargo. And now, Paul said, I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. So he said, I've got good news for you. Nobody on this ship is going to die, but the ship's going down. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, for thou must be brought before Caesar. And lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God. Hallelujah. That it shall be even as it was told me. Oh, that's what God wanted. That's what the Lord wanted from his disciples. He wanted them in the midst of the storm. Rather than coming to him screaming, Lord, don't you care that we perish. He wanted them to be able to say, I believe God. Hallelujah. Oh my God. This storm doesn't change me. This storm doesn't affect me. I believe God. Whew. My Lord have mercy. There are times when the storm, listen to me, is part of of God's plan. Occasionally, the God of our salvation seeks to reveal himself to us in some wonderful way by walking with us through the winds and the rains, not by causing the storms to cease and the seas to call. It's another old song. It's been sung over the years. It was made famous by the popular Elvis Presley. Many years ago, he sang the song, You Will Never Walk Alone. <laughs> oh, and in the song, You Will Never Walk Alone, this argument is made as it says, when you walk through a storm, hold your head up high and don't be afraid of the dark. At the end of the storm is a golden sky and the sweet silver song of a lark. Walk on through the wind walk on through the rain though your dreams be tossed and blown walk on walk on with hope in your heart and you'll never walk alone <laughs> he got the point of the passage that I'm preaching from today. Hallelujah. The writer of that song got it. He got it. He understood it. Hallelujah. It's not about God changing the circumstance to make it easier. It's not about God changing the circumstance to make things more pleasant for us. No, it's about learning to believe God when things aren't easy. It's about learning to believe God when things are not pleasant. Rather than always seeking the easiest and most carefree path, the Lord wants us to learn to trust Him when things are at their most dreadful. 
He often has a plan in the midst of our calamity. The Philippian jailer would not have found Christ were it not for the beating and the imprisonment Paul and Silas had to endure in Acts chapter 16. Those who experienced the shipwreck with Paul in Acts 28 would never have found faith in Christ were it not for that shipwreck. Because it was after that shipwreck as Paul was gathering firewood that he was struck by a deadly viper. And yet, without incident, they watched him, carefully watched him. They said, we know what happens when someone is bitten by one of these serpents. Usually within a short time, they're in agonizing pain and they fall to the floor unable to move and they become paralyzed and eventually their heart stops and they die. And they watched Paul and they watched Paul and they watched Paul and they watched Paul and, watched Paul, and nothing changed. And this man who said, I believe God when the storm was raging and the ship upon which he was riding was just about to fall to pieces beneath his feet this same man is struck by a deadly serpent and there is nothing nothing negative that comes about Oh, ho, ho, ho. sometimes, Amy, sometimes God needs us to go through that trial we're in. It's not pleasant, it's not fun, it's not good, but there is something good to come of it. He has a plan. All things work together for good to them that love God. To them who are the called according to his purpose. Those who, ex uh, the problem is most often that we do not want to be the vehicle by which the Lord reveals himself to an unbelieving world. We want to pick and choose who the Lord reveals himself to through us and just exactly how he does so. But he desires that we allow him to use us as he wills. And this often means we must ride out the storms and endure difficulties and hardships. In 2 Timothy 2 and 3, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. In Philippians 4, 11 through 13, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned, Paul writes, in whatsoever state I am in, therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Paul says, good times are bad. I can make it, oh my Lord, through Christ. That's the lesson the Lord wanted his disciples to learn in that storm. He didn't want them to see his divinity revealed in that he was able to calm a raging sea and bring quiet to a stormy night 
with the word of his mouth. That was not his intent. That was an unnecessary act of God. We tend to be preconditioned to run from the slightest signs of trouble or distress. But as children of God, we must learn that blessing, listen to me children, blessing often comes from troubled waters. I'm almost done today. John chapter 5 verses 2 through 4. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue, Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. When the waters of Bethesda were supernaturally troubled, the natural tendency might have been to run from the pool. But those who knew the reputation of the pool knew that troubled waters meant a blessing and a healing for the first one in the pool. How pleased must the Lord our God have been as he witnessed faith-filled people with all kinds of sicknesses, diseases, and, and infirmities running toward the troubled waters rather than fleeing the scene. Hallelujah. Oh my Lord. God's people do not run from the roar of the lion, but rather they run toward the roar. Hallelujah. Like a police officer who runs toward the sound of gunfire. Our God seeks a people who are not afraid of the sounds of trouble or the signs of danger, but who are filled with faith and filled with Holy Ghost authority so that they run toward the trouble and not away from it. My Lord, have mercy. Well, I've done preached myself happy. I wish we had a church full of people that get happy in the Holy Ghost and shout about it for a while. That would be nice. The next time we face the howling winds, or we are subjected to piercing rains, Rather than crying out to the Lord for intervention, pleading with Him to calm the stormy seas, He desires that we walk in faith and confidence in His care for us. He seeks a people who walk by faith, not by sight, and who do not constantly cry out, for unnecessary acts of God. Hallelujah.